loud. Okay, so this is welcome to the premiere program in the um, Everything We Eat series. And um, I just want to let, uh, you know, everybody, well, the two or three, and Anthony, you're welcome to join us because we don't, you don't have to be a patron. Um, on November 16th, we're doing a program on um, the birth, death, and rebirth of the cocktail in America by oh. a mixologist that presented to the, to the Mammoth uh, Women's Caucus. Uh, fundraiser. She's going to talk about the origin of the cocktail in 19th century America, the impact of prohibition, the current cocktail renaissance, women and the cocktail, which I'm interested in hearing about, and demo of three cocktails and when to shake or stir. She is um, a mixologist, but she is so many more things as well. So she's a true renaissance woman. So um, with only six of us on, or seven, I'm sorry, Beth, you're there, right? I'm here, but I can't figure out how to get the video. It says do not allow access, so that's okay. On the lower left-hand side. I have such an old iPad. It doesn't work. I tried. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, that's okay. Maybe next time. Okay. So I just wanted to be sure you were there. Yes, um, I'm here. So I'm really not going to mute. We don't have enough participants, so I'm not going to mute things. But um, And I'm also going to send links. I meant to have them in the chat box, but I did not put them in on um, a seasonal vegetable chart so that you'll know what's in season when in New Jersey, something on Jersey Fresh so you know what grows in New Jersey, and something about gardening in case you're interested how to garden. Um, but the, you know, the one thing I wanted to say, I wanted to start a little bit of a discussion about seasonal eating and say that in addition to the health benefits that Anthony's going to talk about, there's a sustainability aspect to eating seasonal vegetables and fruits and produce that comes from the area that you live in um, because it, there's less resources to transport it, usually less resources to grow because it's usually grown on smaller farms. So you're doing more of a locavore kind of thing. And locally grown um, produce usually is grown with less pesticides and they probably do integrated pest management. And as I said, there are less resources to get it to market. Um, and, you know, everything we know New Jersey is for tomatoes uh, that we grow tomatoes and peaches. Does anybody know anything else that's really a big crop in New Jersey? Cranberries. Blueberries. Yeah. Blueberries. Beth, Beth, what did you say? Cranberries. 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 Yep. Really? I, I, I heard some place eggplant. That didn't come up. <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> what about uh, where it was like a trivia <laughs> question? I heard it once. Well, I'm going to check on that. <laughs> eggplant. Okay. <laughs> So just so that you know, we have over 9,000 farms covering about 715,000 um, acres. We're fifth in blueberry production, third in cranberry production, third in spinach production, third in bell pepper production, and out of order, fourth in peach production. So tomatoes aren't even one of the top five vegetables wow. that we grow, which is sort of interesting, but um, it says also produce in abundance is tomatoes, corn, apples, strawberries, potatoes, hay, and soybeans. Some of those things I wasn't aware of. And um, now everybody's aware of the cranberry bogs down in the Pine Barrens, but are you aware how cranberries grow? Anybody? Obviously in water, right? Bogs? No, they actually don't. They, they grow. Yeah. No, they, they don't. They get it's, flooded. Yeah. For picking them or something. Fred oh, and oh, that's place. right, yeah. They grow in sand and they, apparently they have little cells of air in the berry. So they flood the bogs, they shake up the plants, the berries all come to the top, and then they have these machines that go through and, um, you know, sort of, uh, it says egg bit. They, well, for, yeah, they stir the water and the machines come through and sort of gather them up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I sort of knew that because Rutgers, where I worked and where Anthony went to school, has actually, they do a lot of research on cranberries, a lot of um, uh, the um, um, extension does a lot of research. So at one of our extension uh, annual conferences, we actually got to talk to somebody that did the research and she told us all about that. So mm -hmm. now on to our program, let me introduce Anthony, who, as I said, worked with me when he was a student at Rutgers. And I always found him to be a very impressive person. I hope you don't blush, but anyway, he's a registered dietitian, nutritionist, health educator, and a lifestyle medicine practitioner and public health professional. Um, he's a professor in the School of Health 
Service Sciences at Stockton University and is the B VP of Nutrition for Wellstart Health Inc., a lifestyle medicine organization. And he'll give you uh, contact information at the end and we can also pass it on in a follow-up email. Um, previously, Anthony worked as the outpatient and community education dietitian at Princeton Medical and was a community health dietitian at Central State Medical Center. Uh, take it away, Anthony. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you very much everyone for being here this evening. Oh, let me just um, interrupt one second. If you have questions, please sure. put your questions in the chat box. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Not at all. It's always a good reminder. Absolutely. So one of the great things about Lisa that I've always kind of take away from this topic of eating seasonal is it allows people to start to think about their food in a way that is perhaps health focused, but isn't only. And I think that is important because sometimes in the pursuit of trying to eat more healthfully or live more healthfully, um, we tend to make our food or exercise, whatever the topic may be a bit clinical. Um, and that can make it seem a bit dry and lifeless where seasonal eating, while there are some interesting discussions to be had about health benefits, um, it does allow us to think about our food also in terms of, as previously mentioned, sustainability, as terms of benefiting local agriculture and products. Uh, so it's a nice way to think about our food that isn't always in this um, very, for lack of a better word, kind of numbers oriented way. Um, so some of the things that I hope to discuss is just a little bit of information um, about seasonal eating in New Jersey. And since we're in the autumn, I'll kind of be specifically focusing on the autumn uh, seasonality right now. What are some of the health benefits and strategies um, for eating more seasonally in ways that we can incorporate this into our day-to-day -day eating? Uh, and again, in a way that is celebratory, in a way that is interesting, is in a way that is exciting. Um, so with seasonal eating, I mean, it's a wonderful thing of where we live in this state. Um, just the incredible, almost year round availability we have um, for local produce. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of the things that are available again, just in the autumn alone, not to mention even some of the things that grow in winter and then certainly uh, spring and summer as well. But what I wanna really emphasize here is variety. And one of the things that can be exciting and helpful about eating with a more seasonal mindset um, is that it does encourage or at least get us to think about the great variety of produce items that we can choose from. Um, because even if somebody is eating an abundance of vegetables and fruits, which is so critical for good health, we tend to fall into the same patterns week to week to week in terms of what we choose. And while there's really nothing inherently harmful or problematic about that, in fact, uh, repetitious eating has some benefits in terms of being sustainable when it comes to eating healthfully. Um, it's nice to increase the variety um, of plants that we are eating on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, this actually gets into some of the research that's being done on the gut microbiome, which I'm sure some of you may or may not have um, come, come across in the last several years in particular but the bacteria within our digestive system is being looked at more and more and more for how it influences not just digestive health, although that alone is reason enough to support the biome, um, but weight management, insulin sensitivity, cholesterol production. Uh, there's even some preliminary discussions about how gut health might have connections to certain autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, lupus, and others. And one of the things that promotes a really good, healthy, robust gut biome is a variety of types of plants uh, because it is the fiber and it is the starch within the plants that we eat that feed and promote and determine, frankly, the types of bacteria we have. So if you are the kind of person that really likes greens and you eat kale very regularly, that's lovely. But to even further enhance the health benefits of our diet, well, we also grow arugula, which is another type of green. We also grow bok choy, another type of green. We also grow things like chard and mustard greens and dandelion greens and lettuces and collard greens. So even just by focusing on just different green vegetables right there that are grown in this state, uh, we can increase the diversity and the types of green leafy vegetables that we might be eating. So we not only get this nutritional benefit, 
but we also get this incredible benefit to our gut health uh, and to our digestive health by introducing a variety of different types of fibers and types of starches and types of plants in. Um, there's even some discussion that great, uh, creating a greater diversity, a greater spectrum of types of plants consumed may be independently predictive of plant of a gut health uh, beyond even just fiber intake. So even for people who have health needs or digestive health where a very high intake of fiber can be problematic, staying within a level of fiber intake that is currently comfortable, but increasing the diversity of foods consumed uh, can be really wonderful. Another thing that is fantastic about the autumn in particular um, is the amount of starchy vegetables like butternut squash and pumpkins and other sorts of winter squashes that come up right now. And those starchy vegetables are especially health promoting. Um, again, they have these types of starches that the bacteria in our gut love to eat, but they are also very good at increasing the, for lack of a better word, the viscosity of the food we're eating that thick, sticky kind of texture, which has benefits for body weight management, for cholesterol production, for insulin sensitivity, blood sugar management, and others. So what I really love about this is, again, without necessarily trying to focus on something that can be as dry and frankly unhelpful when it comes to judging the health value of food as just overall calorie content, by looking at the seasonality of the foods we eat, uh, maybe I don't really cook with a lot of cranberries currently because I really just make them maybe on the Thanksgiving holiday season and that's about it. But if I know that cranberries are something that is produced in great volumes in the state and is in fact a locally produced fruit, it might encourage me to cook with them a little more regularly than I did before. This helps to make our food more interesting. It helps to make our food more varied and maybe has some of these additional health benefits as it, beyond what we might normally get that I just may normally not look at cranberries and give them much thought because I'm not thinking them as something local. Uh, same thing with spinach. There's all these, again, wonderful things that are being produced locally that we just don't notice as much for some reason. So when we are aware of what is being grown in each season, maybe I don't really feel like eating cranberries all year round, which is fine. But even if just through the autumn, I bring cranberries in. And then once the autumn is done, I replace them with the next fruit that comes in a season. Now I have a year round sort of uh, spectrum going and rep and, 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 and uh, cycle going in terms of the foods that I'm consuming. And so all year round, I'm exposing my body to different types of benefits in terms of the fibers, different types of benefits in terms of these plants. And I'm continually renewing and nourishing this healthy bacteria within my digestive system. All done by simply focusing on what is in season. Um, one of the greatest concerns that I have and that I have seen is how much money people will spend on supplements. Not that supplements do not have a role at times uh, in a healthy lifestyle, but for a fraction of the cost and frankly with greater enjoyment, many of these same benefits, if not greater, can be found just in these foods that are being produced. So there are these fantastic benefits just in seeing what is being locally prepared. And again, we are so blessed to be living in a state uh, where this is even easier. But there's some additional benefits that are being looked at as well that go beyond even just personal health, but uh, global health and sustainability as well. And interestingly, a lot of the research and a lot of the scholarship in this area um, is looking at to see how we eat impacts the health of ourselves as individuals, our communities and our larger environment. And so there really is this debate right now of what is more appropriate, eating seasonally locally or eating seasonally in a global sense. And this is probably a little aspect of sustainability that doesn't get talked about quite so much, but it does bear some, some needs. So global sustainability is basically the way of looking at how we can provide a greater variety within the diet uh, and a constant supply of fresh produce all year round uh, based on the fact that we live in a globalized world um, where food is being transported constantly. Um, in spite of the fact that spinach is grown here in New Jersey, if I go to my you know, next door grocery store, I'm probably not getting a lot of Jersey spinach, am I? I'm probably getting spinach grown in California or other places. And so there is a bit of a weighing of the costs and the benefits of having these foods shipped in because while there is a great concern about 
greenhouse gas emissions, the use of fossil fuels and other things. At the same time, there's questions about, well, what if we try to only supply our states or supply our local uh, uh, communities with only food grown within a certain radius? Uh, the variety of food might shrink in a very dramatic way. Um, so the way that I think about this, at least, is that it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, that eating healthfully, eating locally, it's very much a subjective term, um, and it's weighing out the benefits of focusing on more locally produced agriculture, but also encouraging variety in the diet that may require the shipment of food from greater off. Um, a lot of the high environmental costs uh, is, is to the country as to the country of production. And so this is another thing that people are now starting to think about a little bit more when it comes to eating locally and eating seasonally is what is the cost of the country who's actually producing the food? So if my strawberries are being shipped in from Egypt, um, what is the cost, if any, to Egypt in terms of environmental resources? Is it a strain for Egypt to produce strawberries all year round? If it is, then that is something that needs to be addressed. If it's not, then perhaps that's not the particular area of globalized food production that needs to be looked at. Um, so it's, again, it's not an all or nothing kind of a discussion. And so to be more mindful of these things and to be more conscious of how these are coming in, um, it really does require there to be greater discussion around, well, who's making what, where is it being shipped and what is the cost to this? The greenhouse gas emissions are more related to production methods versus the transportation itself. So while it seems mind boggling about, again, shipping food from let's say California to New Jersey, so completely across the country, the greenhouse gas emissions are actually less due to the shipment, even of those tomatoes from California to Newark, than it is on how the food is actually produced. Um, and so this is sort of the next wave, if you will, or the next evolution of how we think about sustainability and how we think about environmental impact and health uh, and global footprints and carbon footprints and these sorts of things. Um, and so when people say that uh, shipping in food from external sources is bad for the environment, it really needs a much more nuanced way of looking at it. Who's making it? How is it being produced? Those are two much more important questions than even its shipment itself. Um, and so with global seasonality and global production, um, it really is on a case by case basis in terms of how the food is being prepared, how it is being stored, and then how it is being uh, transported. Uh, when we're looking at the more local aspects of seasonality and eating locally, so this typically in a lot of the research that's done is looking at food that's produced within about a hundred mile radius of where you currently are. So we might think of eating locally as only New Jersey, but depending on where New, New Jersey you live, that might also include Delaware, that might also include Pennsylvania, that might also include uh, parts of New York State. Um, so again, it is a little more regional in terms of what might be considered locally made. But in addition to some of these gut biome benefits, uh, we are seeing some other potential benefits as well. One of the concerns that comes up when food is being stored and transported from a great distance is a uh, loss of micronutrients. So these would be our vitamins and our minerals. Um, our macronutrients don't change. So the protein, the fat, and the carbohydrate content of that food is pretty much the same no matter how long it's stored or shipped. The most thing that might happen is some of those starches get converted to sugars the longer that produce is sitting around. But the vitamin and the mineral content may or may not change based on how the food is grown and stored and transported. And a great example of this typically is tomatoes. Um, if you've ever grown tomatoes, you know that you can probably barely get that tomato in from your outside garden to your kitchen without it splitting. I mean, there's just something unique to a garden grown tomato, but how is it that I can go to the grocery store and buy tomatoes that I can throw into my bag and throw into my car and bring back inside and they're completely unharmed? Well, the reason for that is those tomatoes are picked when they're rock hard and green, because how else could you possibly ship tomatoes from Florida to New Jersey or other parts of the country to New Jersey and not have them rot or explode on the truck ride over. So they're picked green, which means they can be shipped green. They're nice and hard like baseballs. They're not going to break. And then when they get to their destination, uh, they're put into a room full of ethylene gas. 
And ethylene gas is the natural gas that any plant makes as part of its ripening process. It's why if you take a bunch of green bananas and throw them in a paper bag with a ripe apple, they'll turn brown faster. The apple gives off ethylene gas. So it changes the color of the tomato from green to red. But as anybody knows from a truly locally, you know, garden grown tomato versus one of these other kinds of tomatoes, the flavor and the taste and the texture are completely different. Well, then so too is the nutrient content because that tomato didn't ripen on the vine. And if it didn't ripen on the vine, it didn't grow as long, which means it didn't get to absorb nutrient from the soil as long. So does it make it an unhealthy tomato? Of course not. Is it as healthy as it could have been in terms of nutrient content if it was picked closer to ripeness, if it was actually picked and then shipped and stored and consumed within maybe a day or two after picking? No, it's not going to be quite as nutrient dense. Uh, and then certain vitamins are degraded as they are exposed to the light, especially certain types of lights. Um, so as food is picked when it's not quite ripe enough yet and is made to sit in the dark or sit in the light and stored for a long period of time, uh, there are certain um, uh, vitamins, especially some water soluble vitamins that can degrade over time. Is this enough to cause nutrient deficiency? Absolutely not. But is it enough that over the course of a lifetime, you're not getting just quite the amount of nutrient abundance you could? It is certainly something to think about. There's also then the benefits to the environment itself. Um, when food is grown in these large monocultures, um, which as someone who himself lived in the Midwest for a good number of years growing up, I mean, that's when you drive through Iowa and it's nothing but corn or it's nothing but soybeans. A concern that comes from this is we are not letting the soil turn over and get a break, if you will, by them planting a different crop there the next year. So there's not good stewardship and care of the land um, when we are growing large monoculture crops out of normal uh, rotation schedules. Uh, and so the soil becomes more and more stripped of nutrients over time. Um, the other concern that comes up with monoculture, which is actually what we're seeing with bananas right now, um, is the loss to disease. So if you go to pretty much any grocery store right now, the bananas you're going to find are called Cavendish bananas. Um, they are being wiped out globally right now um, by a disease, by a fungus, by just something that any living thing gets. But because that's the only type of banana being grown in so many of these production systems, if they lose the Cavendish, well, that's everything. If they were growing 10 different types of bananas and they lost their Cavendish crop, it's a loss, but they have nine other types of bananas that could be okay. So if we want to keep enjoying the kinds of fruits and the kinds of vegetables that we're used to, we need greater diversity of them. So I shouldn't only ever buy the one type of apple because that again, not only is that problematic for soil health, if there's ever a disease that comes by and affects those apple orchards of that one type of apple, they're gone. I mean, the, it's just wiped out. So when we support locally grown agriculture, typically, not always, but typically you'll see apples you've never heard of before, or even things like mint, you know, there's chocolate mint, there's Thai mint, there's mint that tastes like pineapple. There's all of these different things that when you go to a farmer's market or you find a local organization that's selling these things, and you buy all these different types of mint or basil or different varieties of pears and apples and berries and whatever it is that it might be, you're also helping to support them financially so that they are able to keep growing these diversity of plants. Because um, otherwise, if they can't financially keep up, they'll go to monoculture and just grow the one type of you know green pea that Del Monte wants to get or whatever the company that's gonna buy their produce is gonna get. And that's all there is. And so by supporting this biodiversity, we really help to ensure that these things can keep on going, um, especially if you have the opportunity to go a little more north in the state um, or even to the southernmost part of New York state. I mean, some of the apples that are being grown in these orchards are like nothing you've ever seen in any grocery store before, but they have to be supported. Uh, and more and more farms, when the current generation dies, are not being picked up by their children or grandchildren uh, because they're not seen as financially viable options anymore. So there are so many interconnected layers when we support these systems, that when we support uh, agriculture that's being locally produced in all of its ways, um, it helps. 
the last thing that can kind of come from this is not something we think about too much anymore, which is a good thing, but at least from a historical perspective, is that biodiversity and encouraging our farmers and encouraging our local agriculture to produce lots of different varieties of food helps protect against famine. I mean, why was there the Irish potato famine? Because potatoes were the primary source of calorie. And so when a blight comes in and wipes out the primary source of food, primary source of energy for a country, that's it. There's no other way of getting calories. And so from an interesting kind of history lesson, um, one thing that happened in parts of Europe was they saw the same thing happen in Ireland and other places. And for them, their primary source of calorie was wheat. And so they said, well, let's not let that happen here. So they actually tried to get potatoes to take off uh, as a secondary source of calories, a secondary staple crop to prevent this from happening. But because it was something new, you know, the people within those communities did not want to eat the potatoes. And so they weren't catching on. So they tricked the community by actually putting guards uh, and, and soldiers around these uh, royal potato crops to make it seem like, well, this is only something the rich people eat. Only the royal family gets this exotic vegetable. And, but they would purposely let villagers sneak in and steal potatoes out to increase the popularity and increase kind of the mythology around this crop. So that's how they tricked people into diversifying their diet and making sure they were more famine protected um, just by doing this, by supporting biodiversity. So thankfully, we are currently in a state um, where you know, we are not in the same concern about famine and we are not in the same concern about loss of a staple crop. But it is an important under lesson that the more diverse we keep the foods available to us, the more protected that we are. And so there's a lot of different ways. And again, we're very privileged in this state that we are, the strategies to eat more locally are easier than they are in other parts of the country. One thing that you may explore is what are called CSAs uh, or Community Supported Agriculture. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, but for those of you who may not be, a CSA is basically an opportunity to provide a very meaningful financial security to a farmer uh, who is participating in a CSA. And so the way that it works is that if you find a particular farm that is offering a CSA, you buy a share of what they produce for the season. And depending on these farms, typically these shares are as little as 200 and some, maybe upwards to three or $400. Uh, and it's you're buying a chunk of what they produce. So they have a hundred shares available and you buy one of those shares, you're basically buying one one hundredth of what they produce. And so once the growing season begins, you're given typically what's called a CSA box and you get a certain percentage, a certain amount of what was produced that week. And so depending on the type of farm, it might be flowers, it might be herbs, it might be fruits, it might be vegetables and probably some combination of all of the above. Um, and so when the growing season is good, you get a lot more produce. When the growing season isn't as good, you don't get as quite a big a box. But what this does is that even in these moments of a poor growing season, before the season even began, that farming organization got your money for the share. So it helps to keep things going when things are plentiful, and it helps to keep things afloat when things are a little bit more rough. Um, and so you may look to see what CSAs may be near you if this is something you're interested in. Uh, and for the upcoming growing year in 2021, uh, see if they're offering shares. Uh, these shares typically sell out quickly. So if it's something you're interested in and haven't done before, uh, this is actually kind of the time you start to look uh, to see what shares are available because often by the end of the winter, um, they, are, they are sold out. The other thing is to just try new foods. Again, think of this diversity of foods in all sorts of different ways. Um, if you have never purchased any other lettuce than one type of salad green, just start with buying different types of lettuces and different types of greens that might be crunchier, some might be softer and more silky, but just try different things. Even if the only herb you like is basil, again, buy the Thai basil, buy the regular basil, buy the Mediterranean basil, buy the microgreen grown basil. I mean, find all of the different ways this is being grown and just to see the kind of diversity that exists even with this one type of plant, even with this one type of herb and experiment. What I love about plant foods in general with fruits and vegetables is that they don't 
have some of the same food combination worries that you get when you're trying to pair a fruit or a vegetable or an herb with an animal food. So you might wonder, well, what goes with chicken? Not everything necessarily does, but what goes with apples? You almost can't run out of options because since they're all in the same family, they're all plants, they really support each other and they don't typically have these flavor uh, uh, incompatibilities that you might find in other foods. Um, and so just think of anything you could throw it in, even something like an apple that can go into oatmeal for breakfast, that can go into a salad, that can be roasted in the oven, that can be turned into a dessert, There's, it can be turned into a chutney or a relish or a sauce. There's so many different things you can do with this one food. And so just get creative with it and experiment with it. It's really hard to have a fruit or a vegetable turn out bad. It really is. It may not always be the most flavorful thing you've ever created, but it's not like meat that can be over or undercooked. Uh, it's not like dairy, which can be scorched and burnt and now loses its flavor. These produce items just lend themselves to so many different types of cooking and so many different types of preparation. And it can just become exciting to think about what are the different things you can do. And then even at the more traditional grocery stores, often there will be a little local food area, at least in the produce section. I often see sort of out front um, display set up and different sorts of things that can let you know what might be coming from local farms. And again, local subjective, they may mean different things by local, but typically it means within a hundred mile radius. Another organization to check out if you're not familiar with is NOFA. NOFA NJ would be the North, uh, would be the New Jersey chapter, but NOFA is the Northeastern Organic Farming Association. And so NOFA has chapters within the Northeastern part of the United States but NOFA is still to this day for the last, oh my goodness, I don't even know now, 15 years or so that I've been aware of them, they are still the resource I go to the most. Um, they help you to find local produce, especially local organic produce, since this is Northeastern organic farming. Um, they also help you to find CSAs. They also help you to find farmer's markets. Um, so if you are looking to see, are there any community supported agriculture opportunities in your area? go to NOFA NJ, they will tell you who's registered. Uh, are you looking to see what sort of uh, farmer's markets might be available even in the winter? NOFA themselves often hold a winter's farmer's market uh, at least a few times during the winter. With coronavirus pandemic still coming, I don't know right now what their schedule is. If this has changed, at least for this season, it might be. But beyond this season, if nothing else, um, I have been to their winter's farmer's market and it is wonderful because it's not then just produce, but there's other things that are locally produced and made in different ways uh, that are showcased at these and they're wonderful. For those that, of you that might be avid gardeners, they have amazing education about increasing the biodiversity of the crops you grow or supporting the types of crops you may grow um, with less pesticide, less herbicide, less fungicides, uh, depending on whether that's something that you're interested in doing or not, as well as other events. They have tons of speakers. They have experts from all over the country and world that talk about different things related to organic farming, um, biodynamic farming, local supported farming of not just uh, produce, but even things like uh, there's a couple different alpaca farms, even in this part of New Jersey. So if you're looking for locally sourced alpaca fiber that can be made into scarves and mittens and socks and these sorts of things, these are the kinds of things that they provide. Uh, so if you're not familiar with NOFA, I really can't encourage them enough as an incredible resource. And should you be so interested, they have memberships and all these sorts of things as well. So the lovely thing about this is there are people already doing this. Um, sometimes when we try to think about taking on the kind of task or taking on the kind of, of goal of eating more locally, um, it can seem a bit daunting. Um, or even how to begin with this, or again, what do I do with tot soy? Well, I've never even heard of this thing, and now I just bought a big bag of it. Go to where these resources already exist. Uh, go to these sorts of organizations that have accumulated and categorized incredible tomes of information that can be resourceful and helpful. And what's also lovely about these sorts of things, whether it's through NOFA, whether it's just your local farmer's market, whether it's by joining a CSA, is you get connected with like-minded people who have their own 
particular areas of expertise or their own resources or tips to share. Because if we're focusing on eating locally, that means we also have to build our own local community of people. Um, and again, in the world that we are living in right now and the public health requirements that are around us, as important as they are, it is also important that we are not losing uh, connection to people. So even if we can only communicate and work with people and share resources virtually, it still keeps that community going. Um, and so thinking about how you can just right now for the autumn time that we are now in and going into, um, focusing on these things that can be very celebratory is wonderful. The thing that I always recommend to people, regardless of whether we're talking about eating for their heart health or eating for local eating or anything in between, is to focus on what you know and enjoy. If you are the kind of person that absolutely cannot stand kale, don't eat it. And don't have to find a way to force yourself to eat it because again, there's a half a dozen other dark leafy greens that are grown in the state alone. What do you enjoy? Do you enjoy hot breakfasts or cold breakfasts? Do you enjoy soups and stews? Do you enjoy salads? Do you enjoy foods that are grilled? Do you enjoy foods from a particular type of uh, a regional cuisine or something? Do you enjoy food from particular parts of the world? That does not have to change. You can still cook food that has a Mediterranean focus to it if that's the kind of cooking you enjoy, but you're just utilizing individual ingredients that you found at the farmer's market that you know that are being grown locally here. So maybe it's an herb in a cookbook that doesn't grow locally and you, you replace it with something else and you create your own version of it. Uh, so focus on what you know, focus on what you enjoy. What are the things you already feel confident about preparing? What are the types of flavors? Do you like sweet? Do you like acrid? Do you like sour? Do you like salty? Do you like pungent? Do you like bitter? Just keep focusing on that. If you're the kind of person that loves dark kind of bitter chocolate, you might enjoy dark bitter greens and you might enjoy more bitter, more stringent fruits. Let that guide you into finding the kinds of things that you might enjoy as well to keep expanding the diversity of what you're eating. Um, again, with the autumn time as sort of an overly used example is what it is, but soups and stews and these sorts of high moisture cooking methods are great. And again, especially if you don't know what to do with something, throw it into a soup, throw it into a stew, especially if it is a plant. Uh, plants only get sweeter as they cook. As you cook and you transform these starches into sugars, it gets sweeter and sweeter. So even something like radishes that are so hot and peppery in their raw state, if you have never oven roasted radishes before, or you've never braised radishes before, or slow cooked radishes, they're so incredibly sweet. When they cook that long, they're sweet, like onions get sweet when they cook. So when in doubt, just throw it into something that's gonna cook for a couple hours and it will get soft and it will get sweet and it will get succulent. And it's just a lovely way to make sure that things don't go to waste in this way. And again, plants pair well with plants. Don't worry so much about the food combinations for my whole career. Anytime I've done anything that has anything to do with, uh, you know, looking at different recipes or trying to cook differently. One of the most common questions that come up is, but what does it go with? Like, what, what, what can I pair this with? If you're pairing it with other plants, it's going to work. It, even if it seems like a strange combination, they are all within the same family. They're all going to work. It's going to be okay. And the other thing, especially with autumn time cooking and winter time cooking is to celebrate comfort foods. Um, very often people, I hear people say these messages about staying away from comfort foods, but I find that to be awful, frankly, as a way of thinking about it. Food should be comforting. Um, it is not a mistake that we derive so much of our feel good, you know, neurochemistry and we get so many different types of hormonal changes when we eat foods that have, we have identified as comfort foods. That is supposed to happen. We are supposed to feel good when we eat. There is nothing inappropriate about that. If we can make our comfort foods as health promoting as possible, that's certainly a good goal for any of us, but these starchy vegetables and naturally sweet vegetables and squashes and things like this right now, they help to get us through the autumn and the winter. They help to make us feel warm from the inside out. They help to give us that wonderful 
bit of dopamine hit and serotonin hit because we need that when it's dark all the time and it's cold all the time and we're being blasted with seasonal affective disorder. These foods are there to keep us going through. Again, it's eating locally is eating with the environment and this is what is coming out from it. Um, so don't stay away from these things. Don't uh, avoid the sweet potatoes and the white potatoes and the pumpkins and the delicata squashes and these sorts of things. These are the foods we should be emphasizing right now. And what's wonderful is they store well. So even if you buy my favorite squash on earth are delicata squashes and they are in season now for their short window, I buy them up as much as I can and they last a while. And so they can be a wonderful thing to kind of keep on hand to keep these sweet flavors going. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, little desserts that I make for myself um, during honestly any time of year, but especially this time of year um, are these sort of little, I, I do mine as a little wedge instead of squares, but these squares, these pumpkin pie squares. What I like about this is the recipe here, as you can see, calls for uh, 15 ounces of like pureed pumpkin, which you could easily get out of a can. But if you are feeling so bold and daring, you could actually purchase a cooking pumpkin, a nice sugar baby pumpkin or something and cook it. And then if you enjoy this, you can also replace it with other things. And so you could cook this with purple sweet potatoes. You could cook this with other types of sweet potatoes. You could cook this with pureed butternut squash. You could cook this with pureed acorn squash. You can cook this with pureed delicata squash. There, you could do this with kabocha squash. All of these different things, this one ingredient you can keep switching out for different types of squashes, different types of starchy vegetables that you might be picking up. So if it's something that you find you enjoy, I find the texture of this has this wonderful, like moist, uh, almost carrot muffin kind of texture to it. I absolutely love it. But you can keep switching up the type of base to it, the type of sweet vegetable that you use in this. And it keeps it interesting. It keeps a variety. I don't know what to do with these sweet potatoes. I'm going to roast them in the oven, puree them up, and make these little bars or pies, wedges, or however you choose to cook them. Um, I, this is one of my favorite, favorite ways to use these sorts of foods. Um, and what's wonderful also is that it encourages very, very, very simple ways of preparation. If you love big complex recipes, keep doing that. But for most people, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but for a lot of people, a complex recipe tends to bring up these feelings of uh, concern, if nothing else. And cooking should not ever be something that somebody feels they cannot do. Uh, cooking is survival. It is how we got nice big brains is by learning to cook our food. Uh, and so if you are someone who does not feel very comfortable in the kitchen, if you are the kind of person that doesn't feel very confident in your cooking, start with these very simple recipes. Uh, and again, this is all plants. It can't be messed up. You absolutely cannot mess this kind of a recipe up and just start to build your confidence in these simple ways. And then you get to go to the farmer's market or the store or wherever it might be um, and get that kind of excitement about seeing what you would like to experiment with next. Um, so after the course of this evening, I'm happy to take any questions that might've been posed now. I'm stop sharing my screen in just a moment. But uh, if anybody has any questions or resources that I can try to share in the future, um, this is my contact information, both my contact information at the university, um, as well as just my personal email address here. I will say the best way to get in touch with me is email in general, uh, but especially with everything happening right now, I will not be down in my office for the foreseeable future at the university. So phone's not going to be a great way to get a hold of me. So either of these uh, email addresses would be good. Um, or if anybody's interested in things pertaining to uh, lifestyle medicine, these things, um, always feel free to get more information um, at WellStart Health here. Um, but what I'm going to go ahead and do now is stop sharing my screen so I can actually see the chat box and things that might have been shared um, and take any questions, comments that anybody may have um, based on anything I've shared or haven't shared that you would like to take some time to discuss. So far, no questions uh, in the chat box. Does anybody have anything they want to Ask I, yes, of course I do. Uh, I have two <laughs> questions. Thanks, thank you. I didn't get it because I just got my pen. I ran. I just found out how to get my picture on Zoom. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I wanted to get the email address of CS. I, I don't know if AB 
And I wanted the other email address of, um, uh, there's something else. One was the CSAB and one was SCA or something like that, or no for, no for New Jersey. Yes. That's so what I'd like to get. I I'll just put that. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I just put this in the chat here. So it's nofanj.org. Um, this is where you can find information about local. Uh, so the CSAs, the Community Supported Agricultures, these are different county by county by county. So the best thing to do is to go to nofanj.org and based on where you live or based on where you might be looking, at least for the state, um, you can look these things up. I actually Googled it um, during the program. It's really easy to find. The, yeah, you know, they are uh, yeah. wonderful. They do such a good job. I love it. <laughs> and I'm going to include all of this in a follow-up email, um, and I'll oh, give great. you some other resources as well. So mm -hmm. The recipe as well, okay? Yes, Anthony, yeah, if you can send me that. Yeah, that was a great, great. recipe. <laughs> it's a good one, absolutely. Uh, Anthony, quick question. Are you a vegan or a vegetarian? Because you it's a I, great cake. Oh, <laughs> I just think by your face that you're so, good, that, well, good. I'm glad I'm at least coming off that way. So yeah, so I, I personally eat a vegan diet. I've been eating a vegan yes, diet for about 18 yes, years yes. now. Wonderful. You look great. You should do a program about that. Thank it's you. in the well, works. Actually, that, that is a plan for the future to have a program on vegan cooking and, and diet and vegetarian and just, uh, you know, as we go along and, and formulate that. And I have asked Anthony to perhaps participate with us again in the spring, um, doing a program on vegan diets, so. Thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else, comments, questions, thoughts, anything? And again, I'll make sure that uh, the library has a, a copy of all these slides and materials that can all be shared out to everybody. So uh, anything else? Could I just what ask you like during this time, you know, talking about the global supply versus the more local regional supply. Uh, Ruth Raquel uh, did a program where she was saying she sees this as a turning point, you know, for the country, because do we want to massively grow things in these giant farms, or is this the time to really look at regional, local? I mean, we are lucky in Jersey. Mm -hmm. You can get local things pretty much all year, or even you know, if you have a small garden, grow things, a, a few things anyway. But do you see this as a time for a real change in how people begin to look at food and, and buy their food? Yes, um, I do. I certainly think it has the potential for it. You know, whether we'll have that kind of critical mass moment that really shifts sort of our collective approach to how we access food, grow food, think about food, I think will be to be determined. But I see a lot of echoes here of, you know, victory gardens during World War II. Yeah, I see yeah. a lot of echoes yes. of these sorts of things coming up, which is exciting and encouraging because interestingly, and there's especially a lot of research that came out of um, England during this time, but all sorts of things during World War II of how much heart disease rates dropped and other sorts of disease rates dropped as food was being rationed, people were growing more produce, so there was actually increases in fiber content and decreases in fat content and all these things that happened um, that of course disappear when all the money comes back. Yeah. Um, but the hope is, can we kind of keep this thing going forward? And so I, th this, uh, what is sort of the, you know, for whatever any of these words mean, um, the urban homesteading movement, which is even for people that are living mm -hmm. in more urban areas, but how they can kind of homestead in this way, how they can think about canning or how they can think about uh, drying out their own food or growing their own food, even on rooftops, right. it is absolutely increasing. And I think what we're experiencing with the coronavirus right now uh, is only further bringing this in because I'm sure everybody else, you know, especially earlier on, you'd go into the grocery store and half the aisles were bare. Right. Um, it, I think it has kind of reminded us that it it is a good bet, if nothing else, to have as much food we can be a little more in control of that way. So I am encouraged by it. We'll, we'll see, I think, what the year ahead brings in terms of how this continues to shift. But I think there are a lot of things primed to make this even more present in people's minds. And I want to add on to that by saying, first of all, when I talk about gardening, I have a little deck 
So I garden, I grow tomatoes and I grow arugula and I grow, and I even tried um, watermelon radishes this year, but I didn't realize they, they're so big that that was a fail, but not for next year. But I will tell you also, I've been participating the last few days in the Academy of, Di of Nutrition and Dietetics annual conference virtually. It's, it's, first of all, the technology is phenomenal, but I'm seeing a lot more presentations on sustainability and even um, the tone of some of the, I went, was in in one presentation, which was really sort of uh, looked to be financed by a lot of commodities, people who, who take money from commodities, there was almost a defensiveness about them trying to explain why this is not a good idea, but it didn't really come through to me. But I was very interested in how many sessions there were on this kind of thing. And we're starting our seed library. And it'll be interesting to see. I expect it to be very popular. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see, though, and what exactly happens. But I agree with you. I think that there's a moment and hopefully we can capitalize on it. Absolutely so. Yeah. Anthony, I wondered if you had any information on how uh, farm markets have done this spring summer, because I know as soon as like in March into April, as soon as I knew there was a farm market, I was running out to go just to be outside. And also like you were just saying, because the stores did not have a lot of things that people were used to having. So I'm just wondering if you had any idea how that, in, how that was doing this spring and summer. So interestingly, um, farm, the, the little bit that I have seen on this, I know um, uh, uh, WHYY, um, was talking about this kind of earlier on. So like the, the Philadelphia public at was back in April or so, we're saying like, you know, people are sort of battening down the hatches, getting ready for the explosion onto the farmer's market scene that they anticipated. Um, and indeed, overall, I haven't seen anything too official, but the little things I have seen is that they did well. Um, I live uh, in Brick currently, and we have a farmer's market in Windward Beach uh, State Park. I mean, it was every single day, every weekend, it was packed to the brim. Um, and That's I know a big one. I've been it, there too. It's, it's very great. Big. I mean, yeah. it's wonderful. And what's also, I think the other thing that turned people to them was they were outdoors. And so especially yeah. with trying to stay out of circulated air and HVAC systems and these things, people felt safer to be outside in these ways. So um, I'll be curious to see maybe if now that the height of the farmer's marking season is, is over for so many, um, if we'll start to see some numbers. But I know um, overall, it seemed that they were doing quite well um, and that they were they were being well supported. Um, the, I think the other, the flip side of it though, that was being discussed were as people were potentially um, uh, losing their jobs either temporarily or permanently mm -hmm. because of coronavirus and shutdown and these sorts of things, whether or not those farmers markets accepted things like um, WIC, whether they accepted yeah. things like um, food stamps, whether they accepted, um, oh, what's the other one, like uh, senior dollars for uh, farmers markets. I can't think of that exact term right now. Um, that was a big determination and whether those farmers markets did well too, is whether USD, they were making- Yeah, yeah USDA making, is really working on getting um, they had, and then they sort of dropped the ball, but I think they're getting uh, on board again with having farmer's markets take EBT and, mm -hmm. and WIC uh, vouchers and things like that. So Yeah, so I think the ones that were, were prepared for that, that, that made that side of accessibility available, um, especially did well. Mm. Good. Yes. What do you teach at Stockton? So I teach in the bachelor, currently I teach in the Bachelor of Science and Health Sciences program at Stockton. Um, so these are for students that are interested in going into a variety of different types of careers in healthcare. There's a lot of popularity in things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, physician assistant studies, and speech language pathology. Those you are kind of our top ones. Though? You, you teach I, yeah, so I teach a couple different uh, therapeutic nutrition courses and community nutrition courses and some of our... Um, core health science courses. And I also have a great interest in the health humanities and the importance of the humanities education and healthcare. So I teach a couple courses in narrative medicine and uh, medical humanities and those sorts of things. I'm trying to get a master's in public health 
community nutrition degree started there. So hopefully in the next oh, yes. maybe oh, year or two or three, if things aren't too slow down, that will be something that we'll be doing soon. But that's, that's at least what's keeping me busy in the meantime. I have a health science senior. My daughter's a health science senior at Stockton. Oh, she really? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a small world. How yeah. about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Judy, you, you have a question from Lauren. Oh, I didn't see that. Sorry. Oh. Um, okay. You see that, Anthony? Yes. Seem to be leaning towards plant. Are you? Yes. I mean, it's interesting. Um, with more interest in plant based diets, uh, one of the most driving forces behind it really is not even about health so much. Not that that's not a big consideration, um, but it really is sustainability. Um, a few years ago, the, the vegan vegetarian group actually on our campus did a joint program with um, our uh, environmental health program. And it was all about showing the movie Cowspiracy and having a conversation around that. So for a lot of people, that has been the thing that has driven it the, mo the most. Um, and it, I think especially this got going a few years, like more than a few years ago now when the UN kind of came out saying that uh, more than even transportation of all forms of transportation, um, animal-based agriculture really was one of the most driving forces behind um, climate change issues. And so um, it kind of goes back to that idea of how food is produced is even more of a determining factor uh, in terms of its global impact and even its transportation, not that transportation doesn't matter, uh, but especially um, when it comes to how the food is produced and animal-based foods for the most part are just naturally uh, more environmentally impactful. Um, and so that is definitely something a lot of younger people are, are looking at, um, but it's something that a lot of people are looking at, uh, even if they don't intend to be completely vegan or completely vegetarian, um, there is sort of just this overall desire to be as focused in um, uh, plants as much as possible, seeing them as a greater and greater part of their day-to-day -day diet um, as a way to try to reduce uh, their climate impact. I also think the other thing that's happening is when you look at manufacturing, you're seeing that they're beginning to respond to the fact um, that there is a demand, and especially from younger consumers, for less processed food. And, you know, I think that the processed food manufacturers are trying to clean up their act a little bit. And, uh, you know, you can actually read a label and know pretty much most of the ingredients on some of these newer products. So. Absolutely. So no, I mean, it's, it's encouraging. And it's, it's like with the urban homesteading, people are, are really interested in seeing their food as something that goes beyond so much more than what they initially thought that it really is something that is so much more. Um, it's so much more than just calories, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's more than just the stuff on our plate. It's so it's yeah. exciting.